Today, we conclude our study of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount with a number of metaphors Jesus used to describe what it means to be a true follower of his. Now, to begin with, we're going to go back to chapter 5. At the beginning of Jesus' teaching, as recorded by Matthew, we were introduced to the upside-down values of God's kingdom, which we know as the Beatitudes. Jesus assures us that when we live God's way, we will act as salt and light to our flavorless and dark world, the beginning of the metaphors. So we're to be different. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salt again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Jesus describes what our influence in this world is to be like, salt and light. And who doesn't like either of those? But too often, the flavor of Jesus' followers is more bitter than salty or, and our light more blinding than illuminating. Or then there's the other flip side where, as Jesus warns us, that we're not to be flavorless salt or lights hidden away. We need to seriously reflect on the impression we leave with others. When someone who doesn't know God makes our acquaintance, do they get a taste of God? Do they see his light and truth and love for them through us? They really ought to, or we should be asking the question, am I truly following Christ? Now, this doesn't mean that we will never make a mistake again. However, the life of a follower of Christ is one of ongoing transformation. Month to month, year to year, we should be becoming more and more like Jesus in our attitudes, our thoughts, and our actions. Our lives should look different than those who are not Christians because we have found a different road to travel, which will now take us to the end of Jesus' sermon in chapter 7. So this different way that we are to travel begins in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Jesus here describes the road to hell as a highway with a wide entrance. Well, just this past week, my husband and I traveled to Toronto for our daughter's convocation. You can get to Toronto via a network of roads. You might begin on a small rural road, but at some point, all join up with a 400 series of highways, and you'll find yourself on a vast network of roads with express and collector lanes all heading for the same city. Now, I'm not equating Toronto with hell, though some might, but if you want a picture of the highway to hell, Think of the bumper-to-bumper, high-speed, traffic jam, sometimes erratic and often angry conditions that are found on these major roadways. This is a picture we might fully, more fully understand than Jesus' original audience even did. Jesus tells us this highway is easily traveled, it's not difficult to find, and many choose it. But the ultimate destination will leave people with eternal regret. On the other hand, Jesus describes the road to heaven as a path with a narrow gate. Think of this road as more like an unkept nature trail. The only means of getting on the path is to find the entrance, which is often obscured to preserve its surrounding nature. Once on the path, we can see the imprint that others have left as we walk along. And, and sometimes there are directional markers painted on the trees to guide us, but it is often filled with tree roots, mud puddles, rocks that are, aren't easily maneuvered around. The path can be challenging with its additional sharp inclines and slippery downhill slides. We can walk for miles with seemingly no end in sight until suddenly we break it, see a break in the trees and there before us is maybe a waterfall or panoramic view from a cliffside or a cascade of water rushing over walk, rocks or some other inspiring natural phenomenon. And in that moment, we realize the hard work was worth it. Many people miss this treasure because they refuse to take the path or they miss the gate to get it altogether in their rush. Jesus said that the path to heaven is similar. 
The only way to find it is to recognize that belief in Jesus is the gate to the path. And it isn't easy to walk at times. Temptation to live for ourselves, the hard work of obeying God's laws like love your enemy, and the disappointments that we sometimes face can all cause us to reject Jesus' path to heaven. Most people choose other paths that all join together to make the wide road. They hope that their chosen path will lead to an enjoyable life and heaven. But Jesus said that the wide road can never take anyone there. He's the only way. We will sometimes have company on his path, but can also be a lonely trek. Some of us who begin walking the path choose to turn back, much like Jesus' parable about the seed that falls in the path, rocky soil and weed patches. Others are content to walk alongside the path in hopes of reaching heaven without fully committing. Jesus, however, gave us a warning about those supposed followers whom we will at times encounter. He describes them as wolves, thistles, and unwise builders. So in the next set of metaphors, Jesus warns us against fakes, against people who appear to be followers but are not. So Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Just, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. You see, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, the Bible often refers to those who follow God as sheep. However, Jesus warns us that not everyone in the flock belongs to him. There are also wolves. They've made their way into the church, but for ulterior motives. They aren't there to be shepherded by Jesus. They're there to get fat off the sheep. Unfortunately, they aren't always easy to spot. They, become, they come disguised and claiming to speak for God, but Jesus says that they're false. In recent years, the Me Too movement threw a spotlight on some wolves that had infiltrated the Christian community and were preying on those who claimed to, they claimed to be caring for. Many Christian churches and whole denominations are still in the process of cleaning up the mess that wolves were permitted to wreak among Jesus' followers. But how can you tell a follower from a fake? It isn't always that easy. Jesus tells us, that we do so by the way they act. He then introduces a new metaphor. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit and a bad tree doesn't produce good. You cannot pick apples from a thorn bush and an apple tree will not produce thistles. Likewise, the fruit of the spirit is observable in those who follow Jesus. If someone who claims to be a Christian is not loving, joyful, peacemaking, patient, kind, gentle, good, faithful, and able to exercise self-control, something's wrong. As I've said, we all have momentary slip ups and our transformation into being like Jesus is a lifelong process. But if the Spirit's fruit is in short supply in an individual's life and they don't appear to be making any progress, we have cause to question whether they have given control of their lives to Jesus at all. Long story short, we'll know them by their fruit. Well, what is the fruit? Is it miracles? The use of Jesus' name, casting out demons, prophecy? Not according to Jesus. At the final judgment, some people who thought they were in will find themselves surprised by Jesus' rejection. I never knew you. Yes, they've had the appearance of being one of his followers and even used his name prolifically, but they were missing one crucial ingredient, obedience. Are any of us trying to eat our cake and have it too? Ensure our place in heaven, but, you know, fudge a little when it comes to obeying God. 
Belief in Jesus without submission, surrender, obedience will never be enough because each is required to find the narrow gate and to stay on the path that will lead us to heaven. So we need to ask ourselves the question, what have we substituted obedience for? Is that big, generous gift really an act of obedience? Or is it a way to buy yourself favor? Is all the Christian paraphernalia around your house to give the impression of being a Christian authentic? Or is it just part of the costume? We can substitute obedience for other things, but it'll never be enough. When an individual's behavior gives us pause or concern, sometimes the worst thing we can do is turn a blind eye. However, we're also not called to hold inquisitions to ferret out, ferret out the imposters. Rather, we're to concern ourselves with ourselves, with producing good fruit through our own changed lives. We're called to be ready to intervene for the good of others, but also to keep our walk with Jesus on the right track. There's a balance to be struck. And God's discernment is needed when dealing with those who appear to be misusing Jesus' name for their own benefit. Unfortunately, imposters learn how to hide in plain sight. And just because someone seems a little odd doesn't mean that they're not sincere followers. Jesus tells us to reserve judgment for Jesus. So look, and Paul writes in Corinthians, so look at Apollos and me as mere servants of Christ who've been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now, a person who's put in charge as a manager must be faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. That almost sounds arrogant. But then he continues, I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each of us whatever praises do. So here it appears that he says, hold off judgment. You don't know what a person's motivations are. Well, what about obvious sin? And this is where he writes just a few short paragraphs later in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 8. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother, and you're proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Down to verse six. You're boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is really what you are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Obviously, for Paul, some things are more easily discerned than others. But we must act on the knowledge we're given. Overt sin must be dealt with. But also don't grant, grant blind, a blind seal of approval or denounce somebody simply because they're different. Some things need to be left for God's determination. Jesus has one final metaphor for those who wish to follow him to, the, to end his sermon with. And he asked the question, will what you're building last? So Matthew 7, 24 to 27. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. And remember, he's just finished preaching the whole entire Sermon on the Mount. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds be against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teachings and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Jesus' final metaphor tells us that we are to be wise builders rather than foolish ones. Over the course of the past two months, we've examined Jesus' full sermon as recorded by Matthew, and each one of us has had areas in our lives exposed that need further transformation by the Spirit. 
We need to reform our values so that they reflect God's, not the world's. We've been challenged to love our enemies, not to worry, but to trust in God's provision. To not allow anger to get the better of us and to keep our commitments. To be anonymously generous. To reserve our loyalty to God alone. Not to judge, but to always treat others the way we wish for God to treat us. And so much more. If we're tempted to toss in the proverbial towel because Jesus' teaching is just too hard or let ourselves off the hook, after all, no one's perfect. This final portion of Jesus' sermon is for us. If we choose to build our lives on anything other than the truth of his teaching, what we build can't endure. Because obedience to Jesus' teaching is the bedrock we need. Everything else is sand that is ever shifting with the tides and the wind. I wonder if Paul had in mind Jesus' teaching about his Sermon on the Mountainside when he wrote the letter to the Colossian church, and specifically the verses I've chosen as their theme verses for the year. Colossians 2, 6, and 7 which read, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down deep into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. We each must choose how we will respond to Jesus' teaching each and every day. Now the people in the crowd on the day that Jesus was preaching knew that this was out of the ordinary. Verse 28 says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the law. They were impressed. But was being impressed enough? Will we be impressed? Or will we make the determination to make a change? Determined to receive Jesus and have him say to us at the end of life, well done, good and faithful servant. And I'd just like to finish off with some verses from 1 John, which also talk about living as Jesus did. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person's a liar. It is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one that you've had from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before, yet it's also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I'm living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. And then down in verse 15. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. <laughs>